So we ask you that you sit close and stay quiet. Um, tonight, we're, we're going to learn about Dynamo with Nate. Very uh, quiet. Very quiet. Let's give a round of applause to Nate. So many, in fact, that they're always there's always a failure somewhere, um, and so they had to build the storage system to be available in any kind of failure scenario. Um, the reason that they had to do that is uh, because if they didn't, they lose money. Um, that's a pretty good reason to build anything. Um, so uh, the interface to Dynamo is really. Per page, 
they have a pretty good chance of hitting at least like one that's going to violate that SLA. Um, the other thing that they're talk they talked about at the beginning of the paper is how Dynamo has to give uh, its consumers um, the ability to trade off certain durability uh, characteristics and speed characteristics um, depending on their use case. Uh, and that's, it sort of dovetails with the idea of the SLA stuff. Um, another challenge that they were facing is that they needed incremental scaling. So Amazon's obviously a really large system. Um, their data grows quite a bit and their request can go up and down. Have a graph that shows a diurnal pattern of, uh, of requests. And so basically during the day they're really busy and at night they're not. Um, and so they need to be able to add nodes and remove nodes based on high request load or based on their data growing. And they expect that the system will uh, uh, perform like in proportion to the number of nodes that. What they, and the, another thing is, uh, this is sort of the diagram that I'll be using, this is kind of what they uh, show in the paper, but basically what they mean is if you add a node G, uh, it doesn't affect the rest of the system, or it doesn't affect nodes that are far away from, from G. want it to have to serve as much as the biggest user in the cluster. Um, and the 
way that Amazon Dynamo deals with this is it basically lifts the key space and assigns a lot more nodes to that key space than there are physical nodes. I mean, it calls those, uh, I think it calls them tokens in the paper, but I'm stealing a term from React here and calling them key nodes or virtual nodes. And, s and then it takes those many virtual nodes and it maps them to the underlying physical nodes. Um, so uh, even though all the examples I'll be showing you look like this, they essentially are, they're actually like this. So uh, if you imagine that there were a ton more nodes on this ring, and then you applied those to the underlying physical nodes, uh, some actually have two, so this looks like this is a little tiny computer, we only want to put two virtual nodes on. Others will have a lot more. Um, and this way, we've got a better chance of any given node getting, we've got a better chance of distributing the packet to traffic evenly. And we also have, uh, we've also solved the problem of nodes that are bigger than others. Obviously, Dynamo has to store multiple copies of anything that comes into the system in the case of a node failure. So let's walk through how that works. Um, what happens is requests will come into the system and we'll walk the ring using system hashing to find the node responsible for that key. Um, the node responsible for that key is uh, called the coordinator for that key. And what the coordinator does is it's responsible for replicating it, replicating the key based on the key's replication factor, uh, which is N here in the paper, capital N for that user one. Um, so in this case, the key's replication factor is three. And what B will do is it'll ensure that the request for that key, it doesn't matter if it's a getter or a put, uh, goes to that many of the nodes. So it'll be N minus one node. This sort of list of nodes is called the preference list. Um, and the preference list is basically just, uh, it contains more than n nodes. So if we have a failed node here, uh, C, then B will have to escape on or, or some other node of the, the hashing ring. Um, so the any keys, uh, preference list is gonna contain more than three nodes, just in case of a failure. Um, the other thing is, it only contains one entry per physical node. Uh, so, when a node fails, it's gonna take all of its V nodes with it. And it just might happen that uh, a physical node will have two V nodes that are, that are associated with your key. And so it's important that Preference list only contains a one entry per physical underlying physical node. Otherwise, it won't get replicated to the proper number of physical nodes, and you, you're not mitigating uh, the loss of data over the future. So the preference list only contains three physical nodes, and that's sort of how um, the coordinator hands out the replicated data or the, the replicas of the data based on this uh, preference list. So the list consists of V nodes, but uh, those they will never list the same physical node twice. So then we have to declare the return yeah. to each distribution of V nodes. Correct. Of the physical node. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, I just want to. I kind of don't remember this. Okay. <laughs> um, so there is always a chance that a node fails. Um, this could.
this goes in tails and into the box. And the way that I set up my slides was that um, what can happen is this replica count is three, right? But B doesn't necessarily have to wait for all of the replicas to respond before responding to the client saying this request was a success. Um, and so what can happen is say, oh, C got it, we're good, and then D could fail on the same request, or the whole ring could, or <coughs> the whole ring could be split in half, and B couldn't, might not even be able to see. Um, and what you might end up with is, or what you're going to end up with is, sorry, in this situation, what can happen is D will get the result from B, and then since we sort of split brain these two sections of the system, uh, we could be operating on oh. <laughs> um, I don't I can't wave my hands the way I want to. Um, and so you could end up with a situation where you have um, two sides of the cluster talking to clients and and the versions of the data could evolve separately. Uh, those replicas can evolve separately. Um, this is what this is what sort of causes uh, this is sort of the root of eventual consistency is that you could end up with literally inconsistent data in the, the same database cluster. Um, and Dynamo provides a few ways of getting too consistent. Um, the big way is vector clocks, um, and I'm going to show you how those work. And so let's say that we're using Dynamo to uh, set a counter, an increment counter. So this counter can't go down, can't stay the same, it can only go up. Um, we initialize the counter at zero, as all good counter programmers do. Um, and then we retrieve it and write it again. And we retrieve it twice, concurrently. Um, and now we have ones for the count, because it's just a count. Um, but let's say that there's like a partition, and those two reads were made by two separate clients, and they're now talking to two different sides of the cluster. Um, what happens is both those increments get sent to either side, um, and the partition heals, or something like that. Um, and we try to read from A. We have no way of knowing right now uh, what the value of K is going to be. Um, and that's because we've written, like, what should the value of K be, for, first of all? If we, we've incremented the counter twice from one. Three. Three? Yeah. So it should be three. But we, we've written two twice, right? Um, and so it should be three, but how do we get three out of this is, is sort of the, the problem. Because we have like inconsi an inconsistent view of the data on either side of that partition that we have. Um, and the way that we deal with that is vector clocks. So let me walk you through this with vector clocks. Um, what happens is every time we write to a node, that node takes the write and it attaches a piece of metadata to it. And that metadata is called a vector clock, um, which is a shitty name for it. It's a, a version vector. Um, and so if a vector is just a list of versions, that, that's a much more understandable way of thinking about these things. Um, and so we initialize this list with a version that contains the node's name, which is A, and the version, um, which is the first version, so it's one. Um, then when A serves a request for a read, it attaches that metadata with it, and it expects, it, it expects the client to give it back the metadata if it doesn't write. Um, and so when it gets that metadata back, it just takes the vector clock, um, finds its entry, and then increments the version. So now we have the second version that was written in A of this, for this key. Um, 
A hands out two, uh, or A hands out this version of the data twice, um, again with that metadata. And then we write back on B and F. And so when B and F both accept the writes, what they do is uh, they try to find themselves in the version vector. Obviously, they are not there yet. Um, and so what they do is they append themselves to the version vector. And so now we have two separate version vectors, even though we have one piece of data. So the counter is two on either one of these nodes, right? Um, and, but we diverge. They're not, uh, they're not causally related, is what that means. Um, so when we read, again, assuming A can see both versions of that data, what should, what does it return? Something else. It returns both versions of the data. So it says, hey application, I actually have two versions of this, I don't know what to do. And it's, be, it's because it's divergent for vectors for that piece of data. Um, and then it expects that the application will see these two versions and merge it together. And hopefully the application is smart enough to see two twos and to write it back as a three. With that piece of metadata, the node basically and can the two version vectors together, and we're back to a consistent piece of data. So this is sort of what it means to be eventually consistent. Um, and Amazon, or sorry, Dynamo has uh, a couple of modes. The one that you should use is my application will handle any merges. Um, the one that is also, for some reason, available is last right wins. Um, obviously, by this counter example, that would not work because you wouldn't end up with three, like you'd end up with the wrong value. Um, but for some application somewhere, that would be okay. Um, so, to do last row wins, it would actually have to attach a timestamp onto uh, onto that piece of, onto that onto that write essentially. Um, and the problem with last write wins is not only would e even if you had the write timestamps, you wouldn't be able to get to three there. Um, but the other problem is clocks are hard. And so with clock skew and stuff like that, uh, you can end up with um, just like wild. So that's version vectors. Is there any, are there any other questions about version vectors? Vector clocks, sorry, I'm using those interchangeably. I believe interchangeably. Uh, yeah. Well, it doesn't support counters. So that that's sort of, um, yeah, so what Dynamo supports is giving you back divergent versions of the data. And so if you end up, if there is an error, right, so if this is like a web application that's putting a counter in, that's like, maybe it's a hit counter, um, then what Dynamo will do is like say, I have two versions of this hit counter, you deal with it, get back to me when you've dealt with it, and the app, the, your hit counter app will know oh, I've, I've got two counters of two, this should be a three, and then write it back to Dynamo, and Dynamo will keep carry on. So it's application level logic. So what's your application that's done that? Can I say anything Yeah. Right. 
So this version vector will supersede these version vectors. Right. Now it's important to note that um, depending on the, your failure scenario, you might end up with like three, four, five, six different replicas. It might not just be two. You can have thousands. Um, and so your app needs to be able to handle that. But like for a more Amazon-y example, like let's say we were talking about the shopping cart and we were storing counts of items in, in Dynamo. If I got five, like, uh, what are those, uh, what are the funky ducks? Like the, the, the hoverboards? If I put five hoverboards in and Dynamo came back with, hey, I put five or six to, to Amazon's like shopping cart app application, Amazon's shopping cart application would likely say, oh, well, we're gonna resolve this to six because we want this guy to have six hoverboards. Obviously, his hoverboards would go. But it, that would be like, that, that, that sort of um, decision is, is actually applicable in a lot of applications. Like most applications could resolve divergent um, replicas, right? Even if heuristically, not, not, uh, not exactly. But there's a whole class of, uh, of data that you can store that can actually be resolved. And there's a whole area of research called uh, convergent replicated data types. Oh, okay. Um, and basically they uh, are coming up with different data structures that you can store in these situations that will, that can be resolved in like a sound way. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about sloppy quorum. If I can say it. Um, so is it, does everybody know what ma majorities are? Everybody knows what majorities are? So quorum is a cool word for majority. <laughs> uh, and, and that's what Amazon, or sorry, that's what Dynamo, I keep calling it Amazon. So Dynamo uses quorum to ensure um, durability of data, basically. Um, sloppy quorum um, is just a stupid name for what they do. Um, basically, we're gonna go through the same thing. I'm, or the same example of replicating out data, um, but this time we're gonna add a little bit of information to the right. So uh, as I said, every key comes with a replication factor. Um, that, replica that replication factor is N, but it also comes with this uh, sort of right durability factor, which is W, and it's, uh, the number of nodes that need to uh, actually write to storage in order for a request to be successful. Um, so if we set right to two, B can count as one of those. Um, and when C res acknowledges the right, then B can respond and say our right is successful. All right. And so what happens is B sends the right request out to C or D and D, and whoever comes back first uh, wins, basically. Um, that it's important to note here that B will send the request out to the number of nodes to n minus one node. So D will receive the request as long as there are no failures. Um, and basically this is just a performance thing, right? Like you only need to know that it's been replicated into two places um, before you get your response back. Um, if C is down, then B will, if, if C detects that, or if B detects that C is down, B will forward the request on to another node, the next node in the preference list. Um, and whoever comes back first is counts it as that right. Um, the same thing happens with reads. So you can have an R factor, which is the number of nodes that need to return before your read is successful. Um, these are the values that they s pretty much recommend in the Dynamo paper. Um, it's, they're the ones that Dynamo uses in like the run of the mill case, but there are, the really interesting thing with sloppy quorum is when you kind of fiddle with these to get different performance characteristics. So let's say I want to trade off um, write speed for read speed. I can set my R to one and my write to, to three, as long as my N is three. I can set my R to one and my write to three. 
Um, and B will still send out the replication request to the number of nodes, but it needs a response from every single one of the nodes that it sends to, um, in this case, the two other nodes, before it responds. So now we have slower reads, right? Because we're bounded by the slowest behaving of these three. Um, but when our R is one, any one of these can communicate with any of the other nodes. So our, our, so our reads are really, really fast at the expense of our writes getting much slower. Um, as long as you set R and W to be greater than N, you're gonna have, uh, you haven't sort of threatened the consistency of the data too much. Um, you basically achieve something quorum-like, they say, which is where I think they came up with the sloppy quorum. All right, so we've talked about sort of how it behaves in the face of failure, but we haven't figured, or we haven't talked about um, how the system actually detects failures. Um, I was just wondering, have you talked about the case where it's looking at less than one? Um, basically, what you'd end up with is a situation, I think, where you're gonna get You're going to get into a situation where you might have never consistent values. Might. Right? Does, does this guarantee that, is it like, as soon as you hit uh, this being true, then does that guarantee you eventual consistency? Or is this, is this something really special about it being greater than n? Or is it just like. If it's greater than n, then you can get eventual consistency. Right. sort of central registry of failures or anything like that. Each node in Dynamo keeps its own sort of local view of failures, and it only does that failure detection when it's communicating with other nodes. Um, and, and, and that's enough, basically, for Dynamo. Um, what happens when it detects a failure, though, is the, the kind of interesting part. So I, I said before that if B was talking to C, C was down, it would forward the request to B. Um, and, and if it's a write request, uh, what it'll do is it'll say, hey, E, this is actually meant for C. Um, and E can accept that write, um, and what it'll do is it'll, every once in a while, poke at C and say, hey, are you up yet? Um, and if C's not up, it'll wait, and it'll wait until C is up, and it'll replicate that write back to C. And so that's the um, all right. Any, any questions about that? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so C doesn't know it needs to read from me. So that'll be, that's considered more of a permanent failure mode, and Dynamo has a way of dealing with that, but I'll describe it in just a second. Question with regard to the preference, the preference this time for it, or is it like the same? So preference? Thank you. 
the subsequent write to B that gets writted for the C, the back lock will um, supersede the So the, the crazy bad case that we're talking about um, will be considered like a permanent failure in the terms of paper. Um, and, and this the example they give is um, let's say D gets removed from the cluster before it can run for the uh the D of the series. Um, what happens is um, there's a process that says the system is doing actively called the ET entropy. Um, and it's basically Nodes are gossiping around and just saying, hey, hey man, you have the series and stuff that I do. Um, and the way it does that is with this is called verbal trees. And so what, what needs to happen is uh, nodes will contact each other on a regular basis at a random um, and try to consolidate the data that they share. Um, obviously, this would be a pretty intensive process. If nodes are wildly the way that I kind of deals with that is by using some of the local trees. Um, and so what it does is for every node that a physical node is stored, it computes this tree by taking all the values of that node and hashing them, and then concatenating them together and hashing them, and then concatenating them together and hashing them until it has uh, this tree um, that it can compare to So these, these two trees are two different nodes that are supposed to be storing the same data. Um, and so they compare the random nodes, and they notice that the hash is different, or that the hash is different, I'm sorry. Um, which means that somewhere in the lower levels of the tree, the data is updated. And so they then lock down um, and compare the child nodes. The one on the left subtree is the same. And so we know that all of the data in the key space on this side has been replicated, that there's no nothing bad that's gone. Um, but we still have to do it from the right hand side. And so we go down a level on the right hand side, and we know that the far the far right leaf node, that's been replicated, so we don't have to deal with that. But this sort of left child in the right subtree has to be transferred over. And the way that's done is they basically consolidate the replicas the way that uh, using the vector plots if they subsume each other. Um, but um, or they'll have to return different uh, different things that they do. So every once in a while D will be like, hey what's up C? Let's check out the trees. And uh, we'll compare the trees and then C will have a little bit of a busy right? No, no, no. Um, I read it in a Wikipedia article because they have, like, this is also used in a few other, like, uh, it, it's mostly just in their hash tables style stuff, like peer to peer systems. Yeah. Um, well, this is a gossip protocol. This is sort of like just a, a cheap way to compare data. So it's like if you look at closures data structures, for example, um, the hash code of uh, two arrays will be the same if those arrays contain the same data. Right? Um, but, uh, and so it's, it's a similar kind of idea. It's like identity and how the array is the same. So, um, you know, talk about how you know, uh, new nodes get added to a cluster. Um, and they discuss this in the paper, um, and then they basically, basically say, like, we don't need anything fancy. When we add a node to a cluster, we need to a cluster. It's an annual process, which means that we have to go. Um, and so, that is sort of, it, it's actually a principle. Basically, 
when I had X and it's going to be a but X does because it jumps in. Um, as part of that same gossip of that's involving the anti-entropy process, um, the gossip around the membership information. And so after membership information is gossiped around, the key is responsible, or sorry, the node is responsible for the keys that X now falls in. Um, will offer up the, those values to X and replicate it over. Um, and so the reason I picked these three is because, let's say N is, N is three for the key. Um, that means that if it falls in between A and B, it will be stored on B, C, and B. Um, and then when X comes in, X now lies in between A and B, so all the keys from B, C, and B, or not all the keys, sorry, the keys in this space that we're handled by B, C, and B need to be transferred over to K, or sorry, X, and by this space, or this space. Alright, I've hand waved on the gossip on protocol. Um, basically, it's used in the end. Stuff. Membership changes on a law. Um, so they're like, uh, this one was added, this one was removed. It's like a Nintendo Wii thing. Um, so there's nothing fancy there. Um, and the gossip protocol is, I think it's like once a second. Each node, it's a node at random. And they just say, hey, it's on. And they do this sort of association. Um, and that um, is how. wants to say, hey, what's up to A, and it replicates membership information over to A. Um, and then those two nodes will collect random nodes and replicate it, and those nodes will replicate that information. So things travel around the cluster pretty quickly. I'm sure there's like a much more sophisticated gossip protocol that they can use, but it's, it's literally like we've just been about the random. Um, there's a good section in the paper at the back lessons learned. Um, they talk about a mode for Dynamo that uh, is I affectionately called Mongo mode, where um, instead of writing things durably to this like the same database, um, what it does is it for the right factor uh, for um, sorry for reaching that right factor say, I've written this right. Um, if you've written it to memory, it's a crazy thing to do. But, um, and then, basically, is that in the buffer of writes, we get left with this periodically. And this is sort of what it probably needed a long time, a long time ago. Um, where it would accept the writes, put it in the memory, and then flush it with this later. The danger there, obviously, is if your node crashes, you've lost data. Um, but they got really good performance out of it, and for uh, applications that need a lot of write performance, this may be an acceptable trade off, trading up the ability for, for, um, for speed. Um, the other thing they give is good statistics on how often those. Uh, those replicas of data diverge. Um, and so it actually doesn't happen that often. Um, basically, 99.94% of the time, they only need a one version. Um, and very rarely, they get more than one version. They also mention that when you do get multiple versions, it's not because somebody's clicking really fast on the shopping cart. It's because, or that there are no failures, or Partitions. It's because they have like cron jobs or long running. Um, so they, they say it's like it's a little bit of a lot 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 of a
gossip us, our one part of the mission gossip and process. So that Isaiah knows where the merchant's request is. Um, there's another in the boat, and then it's probably the default that the server will bounce down. So basically, it just has a machine user interface, and it's going to pop up the phone on route to the cluster. And then if you know where it's a request for the right that we can be responsible for, it will just close the request on the server to the core. Because it will be able to make references to that. They see these huge performance groups. And these are kind of like the uh, specific things that you can see as we get done in our servers. These are 99.9% of our servers. These are critically low. I mean, this is a mission that we started with some of these details. This is probably better for them. Um, but by using the high library, they're kind of coming in response times by about like 60 or so. Yes, yeah, so that's the same as the same. So essentially, essentially, the, the, the three strategies were um, each node with a number of uh, random emails from, from the ring. Um, and the ring would be partitions. So, so if you think of the ring node as a divider at the right hand lane, then that had So the first credit for each round of this is the initial stretch to watch this, was that it's that it had a number of regular threads pulled in each partition edition by that type of value now, which is like the type of sort of this new consistent action that I described as well. The second strategy that I used was that I distributed the Basically, it's divided by the spaces by the number of nodes, the physical nodes. 
and then uh, the size and everything. Like, they have to tell me to use a sign sign. That may not be even a use to the rest of it. They found that it comes to the rest of it. So, like, if the key space is so well, it was not an eye. If you only have to have an eye, and you have three different things, and each node is going to have like 30 feet. So, they found that that was just, was just the best for us to I think it's a has had this particular the characteristics of this kind of thing. This is this is it's only about the power size. Sorry, it's much more easier to see this on the other So, it's not too short to see that space. Yes, yes. You know, it's the same size. So, it's on the other. Yeah. Uh, and then, when a new node joins, it grabs it. It grabs the node to the other node, and the other parts of the world to keep that. So I'd be very interested to see how you have an equal number of partition receipts in the ring. And so the partition is a lot of So it's the uh, so so take take key space and you know, So, 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 each of you know, or, or, it's not one on one replica number. So, so, this, this, let's say, let's say, my analyst is.
portion of the portion of the space. So it's a percentage of responsible for the full time of the space. So this, 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 this,